everybody. This is Mr. Lima again. This time we're talking about cell division. It's the last topic of the cell uh, biology topic or cytology lecture series. And let's get to it. Cell division, the process by which one cell produces two or of, each, of itself. So like you see here in this picture, a, a mother cell becoming a daughter cell. And you see it at different stages of that process. All right? So... Um, what are we set cell division for? Cell division has to do with growth, uh, replacement, and reproduction. So here, for example, you see a sequoia tree. Every inch of that tree was gained by multiplication of cells. Also, when we come from one zygote to a fetus full of cells, it's really because of the multiplication of cells which is causing that. And when you look here at a, uh, at a kid that's growing, it's also because of, of multiplication of cells. It's not so much the cells getting larger, as it is the cells actually increasing in number. Um, also, for reproduction purposes, you're going to need uh, uh, cell division. Meiosis uh, is going to be involved in that process, or even through a sexual division, mitosis or binary fission. We're going to be talking about all these things. And also here you see in the top right side, tissue repair. To, to bridge that gap from that cut, you're going to need cells for the cells to grow back and, and bridge that gap. So Cell growth, uh, and rep cell tissue repair, reproduction are all reasons by which we need cell division. Um, but why do cells divide? I mean, let's say, for example, they, uh, it's not a matter of reproduction. This, uh, it's not because the body is growing. It's not because um, it needs to be replaced. There is well, actually one more reason why cells divide. Cells can't just grow on, grow forever. When you look at something like the size of this sequoia tree, and then you look at this something the size of this uh, fetus on the bottom here. The major difference between them is not the size of the cells, but the number of cells. You would expect a sequoia tree to have thousands of times the number of cells of a, of a fetus, of a human fetus. What, what's actually happening is that it's not that the cells are getting larger, it's that they're getting more numerous. And why is that? Why isn't that you typically find a larger animal with larger cells? There seems to be a limit to how big cells can get. Why? Why is that there's a limit to how big cells they can get? Before we talk about that, let's talk about the size of cells. Cells are tiny, very, very tiny. Uh, if you get like a one meter of uh, cells lined up against each other, you would put like a billion cells in that meter. So to put that in perspective, how many cells do you think there is in, on, on a human being? Trillions of cells. So. Cells are very tiny. So you, you see here in the scale that a, a cell ranges between 10 um, microns and 100 microns in size. The, and plant cells and animal cells will be the, uh, the largest, uh, with uh, plant cells typically being slightly larger than animal cells, and then bacterial cells smaller than that. Then you have organelles like chloroplasts, which are pretty much at the low limit of our light microscopes. And then you're going to need lateral microscopes to see anything smaller than that or the detail inside these organelles, uh, such as things smaller than that, like viruses and proteins and micromolecules like lipids, carbohydrates, or even smaller molecules are smaller than that. And then finally, atoms, which can only be seen with the atom force microscope. Now, as you can see, cells are larger than a lot of things, but smaller than most things because we are all made of trillions of cells. But why is it, is it that cells can't just grow on forever? Well, it all has to do with the ratio between the surface area and the volume. Now, surface area, as you know from math, is the total area of the outside of a two-dimensional object. So, for example, in a cube, a surface area will be basically the each side of the cube, the area of each side, uh, multiplied by six, which because a cube has six sides. Now, the volume is the amount of space that that cube is taking up. Now, if you calculate the surface area to volume ratio, you will see that as the volume increases, surface area doesn't quite increase as fast as the volume does. Now, that, matters, that, that causes problems for the cell because, you see, the surface area of the cell is basically the cell membrane, the cell wall, the, the boundaries of the cell. And then the volume of the cell basically represents the inside where all the chemical reactions are taking place. So as the cell grows in size, as it grows in volume, there will be more chemical reactions taking place, more metabolism, which means you're going to need more nutrients, more oxygen, more sugar, more amino acid, more monomers, more of everything the cell needs to survive. 
And at the same time, the cell is making byproducts, more proteins, more waste, more carbon dioxide. All of these things need to be imported and exported from the cell, and they have to go to that cell boundary. But if the cell boundary doesn't grow as fast as the volume does, as the needs of the, of the inside of the cell increase exponentially, and the surface area doesn't quite increase as fast, eventually the, the surface area of the cell, which is the area that allows for the exchange to take place, those, those cell, uh, remember from the cell membrane transport lecture, those channels, those uh, the carrier proteins, the phagocytosis, endocytosis, all those processes will not be able to cope with the speed that the metabolism inside of a growing cell requires. So as the cell grows larger, it must divide. And that's what it all comes about, comes for. But let's examine in a little more detail this whole deal about surface area versus volume ratio. Look here, for example, at this cube, all right? A cube about one millimeter in um, length will have a, a surface area for each side of one which means a total surface area of 6 when you multiply it by 6. However, the volume of the cube only has a volume of 1, which means this volume would fit inside the surface area 6 times. So right now the cell is able to deal with that pretty well. But as the cell doubles in size and becomes a 2 millimeter per surface area, uh, per um, side, it, it will have a volume, uh, sorry, an area per side of 4, which means the surface area will be 24. But the volume, base times width times height, will be 8. Now, 8 only fits inside 24 three times. So as you can see, as the volume doubled, the ratio of volume to surface area was divided by 2. So as the needs of the cell have increased twofold, the actual ability of the cell to meet those needs in terms of transport through the membrane has decreased twofold. Now, you can keep thinking about this and escalating this. Think about it. By the time you get to 10 times the size, the surface area will be 10 times 10, which will be 100, times 6 will be 600, but the volume will be 10 times 10 times 10, which will be 1,000, right? So as you can see, 1,000 will not fit inside of this twice. Now you're already less than twice, all right? So as the cell grows bigger and bigger, the surface area to volume ratio will grow smaller and smaller, which causes problems for the cell. So that's why we're actually going to be doing a lab about that in class, and there's also additional videos in the playlists attached to the website that you can watch to, that really explain this really well. But hopefully you got the, the main idea of what I'm trying to say here. Now, before any cell division takes place, and we're going to be talking about that throughout these lecture series, we also need to replicate the DNA. Because remember, the DNA is the basic... Uh, structure and a uh, uh, basic molecule that indicates all the things for life. So the DNA will need to be replicated. So that will happen through an unzipping and copying of the DNA through which the chromosomes, which normally only look like a single uh, band of DNA coiled up itself, will double itself up to look like a, this X shape, which will be called sister chromatids. Each sister chromatid is one copy of the actual chromosome. So you actually double in the DNA, and then eventually, doing cell division, that, that X will separate, and then each of those chromosomes, or copies of the chromosome, will go to one of the daughter cells, making sure that each daughter cell has the same material as the mother cell. So within the division, you're going to need to duplicate the DNA. Um, and it's doing this part that when mutations will happen, which will screw up the DNA code, leading to all kinds of problems, and also to evolution. So this, we're going to be talking about that later when we do DNA structure and, and, and replication in the year. But remember that before any cell division takes place, replication is going to be necessary. Now, since we have to talk about this replication, let's talk about DNA and its structure. Now, normally in the cell, uh, DNA looks coiled up, uh, spread out. You see here, in this cell, you see the, the DNA spread out or uncoiled in what we call a chromatin. Now, chromatin is inside the nuclear envelope or nuclear membrane. And if you were to get that chromatin and uncoil it up, you would see it's actually made of supercoils, which are, in turn, made of DNA curl around these molecules called histones into structures called nucleosomes. And those, those nucleosomes can be uncoiled to form the actual familiar double helix that we recognize as the DNA molecule. So chromatin is already coiled up DNA, and that's how the DNA normally looks in a cell. 
And you can see here that progression and how much the DNA compacts itself from the extra DNA to the nucleosome, to the coils, to the supercoils, and eventually to the chromatin. Now, during cell division, to facilitate the process of cell division, that chromatin that's spread out around the nucleus compacts itself into a structure that people recognize as chromosome. But by the time you can actually see the chromosomes, it's because the DNA has already copied itself, so you don't see the single chromatid, which is the actual, if, if the DNA when the cell is normal were to coil itself up, you would only see half of that. But since that this coiling only happens right before the vision, typically you will see the DNA already copied, which is, makes this X shape. But remember that the DNA itself is only half of that. The X is actually two copies of the DNA that you have. And then you see inside the, the nucleus, right before the vision, you will see multiple X's or X-shaped chromosomes, which are basically all of the chromosomes that we have. So that means that we only have one DNA molecule that's continuous, but actually several continuous DNA molecules that organize themselves in chromosomes, which is part of the division. Now, uh, later in the lecture, we're going to be discussing about why is DNA structure in chromosomes, how that facilitates variability, and things like that. Now, let's talk about a little bit more about this the structure of the chromosome here. Now, the eukaryotic chromosome, or sorry, the bacterial chromosome structure is much simpler than the eukaryotic DNA. Now, remember that we did cytology, we talked about the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Over here, you have a prokaryotic cell, and you see that although it will have secondary DNA into a circular shape called plasmid, the majority of the DNA is in a single circular chromosome that attaches itself to the cell membrane of the bacteria. This region where you can find the DNA is called the nucleoid, but it's not protected by an envelope. And notice that it's only one circular chromosome. However, in eukaryotic cells, you, here all you can see is the nucleus, you have uncoiled DNA in a structure cro called chromatin. When this structure coils itself up, you were, you were going to get these single banded chromosomes, um, which are uh, normally how they look like. So you see the color coding here and how the chromosomes will be in the chromatin all meshed up together. But when they call themselves up, you see these single banded chromosomes. Now, also notice that in eukaryotes, you don't only have one, but you have two types for each chromosome. Look here. You have one, two of these large green types. That's because you receive one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad. So you actually have a copy of your chromosomes. We call this homologs, which means basically you will have one chromosome that we see from dad and one chromosome that we see from mom. Now, these chromosomes are basically about the same thing. Both contain the same genes for the same information. However, they will have different versions of the same gene, which means you are going to be a combination of the information from mom and dad put together into what we call dominance relationships. And we were talking, we were talking about that when we do Mendelian genetics later in the year. But... Remember, you have one chromosome from dad and one chromosome from mom about the same chromosome. But there's basically one pair for each type of chromosome. So you see chromosome 1, which is the largest, will have one type. So from largest to smallest, you have 22 chromosomes. And then a, th a 23rd pair, which are the sex chromosomes. We're going to be talking about this in more detail when you do DNA structure later in the year. So here you see again these pair chromosomes. Now sometimes when you see this carrier type, Instead of seeing the singular uh, banded chromosomes, you actually see X-shaped chromosomes. Uh, so you got to see two axes, which is usually what it looks like right before the vision. But these are examples of these chromosomes. Now notice that in this picture here, you not only see the chromosomes color-coded, but you see genes within the chromosomes color-coded. So you see that the, each chromosome is made of multiple genes. In fact, each chromosome can have thousands of genes. And then... That is how you, how you are, basically. Each chromosome will be a one type of chromosome, which will have a pair, and will have store information for thousands of genes. All right? Now, look at the basic structure of a chromosome. A chromosome will have a central structure called centromere that holds the chromosome structure intact. It will have a long arm and a short arm. The long arm is called Q arm, and the short arm is called P arm. And then it will have on the outsides, the corners, telomeres, which protect the DNA from degradation. That is our basic structure of the chromosome. And remember, it only looks like an X before the vision when it's duplicated. Normally, it will look unduplicated like this.
We'll keep it up from here next lecture.